Our next featured speaker is Dr. Sarah Slaughter. So this is a, this is a speaker that's being sponsored by our academic committee. And the academics come, come forward and propose uh, something a little bit out of the ordinary, something new to stimulate our brains. And so uh, Dr. Slaughter was going to be presenting an, a, a piece on regional planning for sustainability and disaster resilience. Sarah is the president and founder of the Built Environment Coalition. Previously, she was associate director for buildings and infrastructure at MIT, coordinating research across MIT, focused on improving the built environment, and led the development of a program to improve the built environment and economic development across New England that involved over 120 companies, nonprofit organizations, and local governments. She has been a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at MIT, focusing on innovations for the built environment, and professor of civil and environmental engineering at Lehigh University, conducting research in the NSF Center for Advanced Technology for Large Structural Systems. Sarah's current research focuses on innovations for sustainable and disaster resilient infrastructure and the built environment. She has published over 50 books and articles and received her SB, SM, and PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Happy to welcome Sarah Slaughter to CII. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure being here this afternoon and, and a real honor to follow Bud. And amazingly enough, we actually did not coordinate our talk, but I think you'll, that you'll find that there's a lot of commonalities in what it is that we're talking about. What I want to talk about is uh, really thinking about the next big challenge that we've got in our whole area. This issue of sustainable critical infrastructure systems. A um, number of years ago, 2009, I was lucky enough to be on a panel the chairman was Admiral David Nash, or, and I was lucky enough to be the vice chairman on this committee. And what we were looking at is those critical issues, which are going to be the biggest challenges to civil society and to commerce for our country and for our world. We are looking at cases where we are running out of resources, where the resources we have are contaminated, and where the number of natural and man-made catastrophes are increasing rapidly. What we were looking at in this National Academy of Sciences um, committee was really how do we change the whole question? How do we look at it in a new framework? And what we started with was really thinking about those critical services. As engineers and contractors, we like to focus on the pumps and the pipes, the nice physical attributes that we can actually get our hands around. But what we've got to do instead is think about, you know, as a friend of mine likes to say, you don't want energy, you want a cold beer and a hot shower. So when you think about it in terms of the critical services, all sorts of new opportunities come up. The other thing that really came out in the work we did as a committee and through the workshops that we ran at the National Academies was really thinking about it as at the regional level. A disaster does not stop at the town line. And if you don't start working with your neighbors, there's a lot of things that might be um, wonderful solutions that end up getting left off the table. One of the other things that we worked on, and I think it's come up in the, in the sessions that I've been in the la here in the last two days, is a lot of these issues about interdependency. Um, as many of you may know, with the wa low water levels last summer, especially in the Midwest United States and in the Southwest, there were numerous power plants that had to shut down because there was not enough water in the system, in the streams and the surface water systems to actually act as cooling. There were also other areas where they were not, they had to shut down the power plants because the water coming in was too hot and couldn't actually be used for cooling. So we have to think about those interdependencies because if we're not looking at the role of, for instance, the power, um, the energy systems in terms of providing critical water services and sanitary systems to our cities and our communities, then we're leaving ourselves vulnerable in huge directions. And the last thing that we talked about on this committee was really being able to develop performance measures. How do we know when we're getting better? As Bud said, one of the things that comes up is how do you know that you're moving forward and you're making a significant contribution to save people's lives, to help improve their health, and to really ensure their well-being as a whole? So what we were looking at um, in that 
research and the stuff that I'm doing right now with the Built Environment Coalition, we're a 501c3, we're a research nonprofit, um, is really looking at the critical infrastructure systems. So we look at the water and wastewater systems, as I mentioned, but also solid waste, energy communications, and transportation. And then the critical built facilities, really thinking about it from the community point of view. So it's emergency response. So it's the police, fire, EMTs, the hospitals and the medical care, the schools, and then there are certain cases where those production facilities can also be termed as a, a critical community built asset. So when we start talking about sustainability and disaster resiliency, there's often a lot of um, differing opinions and definitions. But one of the things I found working with different companies and government agencies and regions is that everybody can agree that the focus is to improve the health, safety, and well-being of people in those communities. Nobody can argue about that. You know, if a company said, no, I, I don't think I really want to have anybody be healthy in my communities, I don't think they would last for very long. When we look at sustainability, what we're looking at is that part of it, which is economic opportunity, fairness, social justice, and environmental regeneration. And being able to think about those three things simultaneously. If you have uh, a lot of economic opportunity, but nobody thinks it's fair, and you're quickly polluting all the water around your manufacturing facility, you're not going to find that you have a very sustainable company. It's not going to operate for that long. So sustainability comes in there in the business sense, as well as what's been interpreted in terms of the social sense. When we think about resilience, it's really this capacity to respond to extreme events. And sometimes those extreme events are economic, and sometimes they're natural disasters, and sometimes they're accidents. You know, they're man-made. But the idea is, how do we build not so that we can try and wall everything out, but instead so that we can actually recover more quickly? The reason I find it very powerful to work with organizations and communities on these two aspects is that in many ways, you can see sustainability as being the more prudent use of our resources. My grandparents grew up on the frontier, you know, in North Dakota, Montana, Missouri, late 1800s, early 1900s. And they were prudent. You, you did not survive if you were not prudent. And over the last set of years, particularly after World War II, we've had such a sense of wealth and abundance and our lives have gotten so much easier. But we forget that in many ways we're still out there on a frontier. And we have a responsibility to prudently use absolutely everything which we have been lucky enough to receive. And so if we think about sustainability as being the prudent use of resources, we can think about it as lowering the base level of resources we need under normal conditions. Which means that during an emergency, you need that much less to keep going or to recover afterwards. So as a simple example, um, talking with a hospital, and they had managed to implement a number of energy efficiency and water efficiency systems. They were in an area that was hit by a natural disaster. And when I talked to them afterwards, they said the fact that they had reduced their energy by 30% and their water by 40% meant that they could keep taking care of those critically ill and injured patients during the emergency. If they had not been able to do that, they would not have been able to keep up operations. So being able to link those two together actually is very powerful. When we think about what's going on recently, um, last year there were significant natural catastrophes all around the world. This is a um, map that was put together by Munich Re, which is a reinsurance company. So they insure the insurance companies. And the magnitude of the impacts is significant and seems to be increasing. I was at a meeting at MIT recently on um, climate change impacts, and one of the studies that came out recently is that there's actually an acceleration of sea level rise on the east coast of the United States. This is data which has been collected, and what they found is that the sea level rise was increasing. The rate of increase is much higher than they expected. And one of the possibilities is that maybe there's actually a slowing down of the Gulf Stream that's going across the United States. So it is no longer blowing off the east coast and blowing those waves away, and instead what we're seeing is much faster, higher tides 
coming up. What we also see is that um, the expenditures at the federal level, just these are just the federal disaster uh, declarations. And those numbers have been increasing over time. 2012's numbers were not quite as high as 2011, but it may not include the rebuild um, after Sandy um, appropriations that were made. So what we're seeing is we're spending more and more to recover after the effects. And maybe what we can really think about is how do we invest ahead of time, and then we don't have to keep doing the rebuilding afterwards. What we're also seeing is that there are a number of conditions which are not cataclysmic events, that are not Hurricane Sandy or a nor'easter, but they're much slower moving um, catastrophes and, and impacts. And one of them, for instance, is the contamination of the groundwater across the United States. This kind of comes and goes depending on whether or not there's drought conditions, whether or not there's flood conditions. But being able to be um, a prudent steward of these resources is part of this whole aspect of the sustainability and the resiliency um, at the regional level. So one of the things that is um, useful is taking a, a general framework like the one we came up with for the National Academy of Sciences report and really putting it into practice at the community level, at the regional level, and saying, okay, what is it that we actually need to do? So FEMA has a number of um, documents that are out in terms of many of these stages here, resources. There's a number of groups that have been involved in uh, local hazard mitigation plans that can also be brought in. But what I'd like to propose is that for really thinking about sustainability and disaster resilience for a regional level, there's a four um, clear steps. The first is to identify all of the wonderful things you have in that region. It's not just going through and counting how many pumps and how many pipes and how many schools, but also looking at what are the capacities, what are the resources, what are the skills in that area. If an emergency comes down, are you going to have enough plumbers around to rebuild all of those water systems? What do you have in terms of creativity in the universities or in the trade schools, in terms of the union training halls? How, what do you have to tap in on? So being able in that first step to not only think about our infrastructure assets, but all of our regional and community assets. The second stage is really to look at what are the vulnerabilities, and I'll go into that in a little bit more in a moment. But the vulnerabilities are really looking at what are the hazards and then what are the risks. The third step is then to be able to say, we could um, look at just dealing with each one of these elements separately and each hazard or each risk or each asset. But if instead you take a real systems approach, one of the things that you're often able to find is looking at the interdependencies between a lot of those assets and between the infrastructure systems and the built environment, a small change can provide significant benefits in all directions. And those intervention points are the sweet spot. Because those are things that a region can do immediately see improvements in the quality of life, see improvements in economic opportunity, see improvements in, in being fair to everybody, and be able to build on that success and get better and better every single time they look at this question. The, that relates to the final element, which is really implementing this using rapid prototyping. Especially when we think about a lot of these complex issues, we wait until it's perfect. Right, and how many people have been waiting on that project you know, that was supposed to happen in 2008, and they still haven't gotten it perfect, so it still hasn't happened. And meanwhile, the communities are at risk. So if instead what we think about is really mobilizing the resources that we've got and implementing them on a fast prototyping approach, get in what you think is going to work, look at what works, what doesn't work, get in and change it, and keep moving forward and keep making these improvements. When we look at the uh, critical um, community assets, as I mentioned, what you want to think about is um, all of the assets, not just the infrastructure assets, but it's often very useful to tie it to a location and then also to think about it in terms of resource flows. How much is going through or, or being processed by these various resource assets? How many kids are going through the schools? How much um, energy is actually going through that transmission cable? 
What that does is it allows you to understand what those vulnerabilities, what the extent of those vulnerabilities and losses could be from an extreme event. The capacity is both um, that maybe the functional deficiencies, for instance, if it's old, as well as whether or not it may be functionally obsolete. And that goes for organizations as well as for bridges. So really being clear about what is it that we have now and what is it that we could be in our very best, as, as Bud was saying earlier. In terms of looking at this characterization of risk, there are a lot of resources. There is, there's been a lot of work that's been done across the United States and internationally on looking at hazards. And there's been a lot of work on assessing risks. I would argue that now is the time for us to actually identify solutions and get to work implementing them and making a real difference. There are, um, every single state is required to have a hazard mitigation plan. And what they do is they go through and they identify a lot of the critical built environment assets. They also go through and identify what are the hazards, for instance, earthquake and tsunami for the West Coast versus um, snowstorms and hurricanes and nor'easters for, for instance, the Boston area. Um, I'd also like to point out that the federal, um, all of the federal agencies have actually submitted their climate change adaptation plans as required by law this spring. And what it does is every single one of the federal agencies goes through and says, this is what it is, this is where we're vulnerable, and this is what it is we plan to do about it in terms of getting less vulnerable going forward. Also, the Department of Transportation and the EPA are working on a regional level looking at the vulnerabilities of the assets. <coughs> Excuse me. As you can see on the bottom le um, left-hand side is the analysis that's being done by EPA in terms of vulnerability to sea level rise and storm surge. This is particularly important for the vulnerability of the freshwater aquifers to saltwater intrusion. The higher that salt water comes up and the, the higher the impact is and, and the lower the drawdown is on the aquifer, the more likely there is for salt water intrusion. If there's salt water intrusion, there's no fresh water for anybody in, in southern Florida. Um, on the right hand side is actually the analysis that the Department of Transportation has been doing, which is the major transportation corridors in the Gulf that will be underwater under various scenarios. So all of those reports are available um, for public analysis. If you have facilities in those areas, it's good to be um, up to speed in terms of what those analyses are for your particular region. With the analysis of the, uh, where the assets are and then pulling in all of these resources that are currently available, you can actually start to look at what are the real vulnerabilities that are associated with those assets. So what is their proximity? to a hazard source, and then what are the interdependencies? So for the example here, this is a power generating facility, which is actually part of a manufacturing complex. It happens that that um, power plant is right next to a surface water system, which is what you would imagine, because it uses surface water for cooling, but it also means it's very vulnerable to flooding into ice jams. It also happens to be in a medium seismic area, medium probability seismic area. So being able to look at that means that if I am that manufacturing company, what would I do if my manufacturing facility um, flooded or was stopped because of ice jam or God forbid there was a, an earthquake and it was damaged or destroyed? What would that do to my manufacturing facility? So being able to look at that in terms of the proximity of the assets and then thinking about the interdependencies. If that, um, power plant went out, would it take out something else at the same time? We were talking at lunch today about uh, Hurricane Sandy hitting especially New York City and the co-location of all of the assets that are placed underneath the roads. So if a water main goes out, if, especially if it blows out, it will often take out the telecommunications, the power um, and the other and the um, gas pipelines at the same time. So the spatial co-location of our assets can actually increase our vulnerability. There's also functional interdependencies. So for instance, if I have a water treatment plant, if my uh, power system goes down, my water treatment system is gonna go down if I don't have on-site power. So being able to think about those elements begins then to identify where the vulnerabilities are, but also gives you a glimmer into where it is you can intervene to make, um, to reduce that vulnerability and to mitigate that hazard. So that's what the intervention strategies are.
to really think about those interdependencies and to say, all right, if I, if I intervene in this location, then I get all of these benefits and I reduce my vulnerabilities in these dimensions. So for instance, one of the analyses that we were doing was for the Finger Lakes region of New York, which if you've ever been up there is an incredibly beautiful region. It's also very fertile. Um, there's a lot of vineyards up there, there's a lot of farms and orchards. One of the things in terms of doing the uh, resilience analysis for that community is there's a lot of the population that does live on farms and they are more likely to have either very young or very old people on those. So they've got a, a high proportion of the vulnerable population. With the number, with the types of storms that run through the Finger Lakes region, it is not uncommon for a farm to be without power anywhere between one, one day to two weeks. And the longer they're without, without power, the more of a threat it is to the health, safety, and well-being of the people who live on that farm, but it also threatens the livelihood of the farmer. You know, if he doesn't have power and he's got a big herd of cattle, he's not going to be able to water his cattle, he's not going to be able to milk his cattle, his cattle may die. So one of the things that we were looking at was how can we identify, now that we've identified that vulnerability, how can we intervene in a way that improves all of the well-being of that area? And one of the things we were looking at was the manure piles. So right now what a lot of the farmers do, especially the ones with dairy herds, is they have a containment facility, they put the manure into the containment, it decomposes a bit, then they spread it on the farms, on the fields. The problem is, is you end up with nitrogen and phosphorus overloading in the surface water systems, which causes algae blooms, which can actually compromise the drinking water for the community. So what we looked at was taking that um, organic waste and actually not only thinking about it as an energy source, such as through an anaerobic digester or maybe a microbial fuel cell, which takes liquid organic waste and directly creates electricity and fresh water without combustion, but then also thinking about, are there ways that we could improve the revenue stream for the farmer? And it turns out there's some new technologies which are emerging, which allow you to quickly and easily separate out the nitrogen and phosphorus in particulate form. And there's a, actually a very good market for that as fertilizers. There's also new systems which are emerging to pull off the fat soils and grease from the systems, such as you would get from a milking operation, and directly turn them into biodiesel. So what we've taken is we've taken something that's literally waste, it's manure, and we've turned it into an on-site energy source for those farmers so that they can keep their operations going even if the grid goes down, and we've provided them with two new revenue sources. What's nice is that region, the Finger Lakes region, has um, a numerous universities like Rochester Institute of Technology and the University of Rochester that have the capabilities to develop these systems as packages and they've got manufacturing capabilities and they've got skilled workers that could quickly and easily move these things out into the area. So that's where you have the local economic growth in the region and at the same time, you're seeing a reduction in, in vulnerability and an improvement in resilience. So my call to the members here in, in the Construction Industry Institute is for every single one of your facilities, you should look at what your resilience is. You need to look through what are the hazards, what are your risks, what are your vulnerabilities, thinking not just about proximity to hazards but also these interdependencies. And when you start looking at those elements, particularly in the interdependencies, these intervention strategies are going to start to emerge because you're going to say, boy, if only we had this. And that's where that glimmer is in terms of finding those uh, leverage points. The second thing I would ask and really beg you to do is get involved with the regional planning in your area. You have so much knowledge and expertise which is so far above and beyond what is available to any of your regional um, organizations. When I look at the, the quality and the tenor of the conversation that I've been privileged to hear over the last two days, there is so much knowledge and a lot of the communities in which you have your facilities don't have a, 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 even a small proportion of your capabilities and they desperately need it to address these issues. Then these issues are gonna come up more and more often and the more we can help each other, the better off we all are. 
What I'd also like to emphasize is that we need to continually reassess our vulnerabilities over time. Things are moving really fast. We never know um, what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. There was the speaker earlier this morning who was talking about, uh, in the session I was in, about building the uh, manufacturing facility in Egypt. And they had decided to build this facility before Arab Spring and are constantly reassessing their vulnerabilities and risk for that facility in Egypt as time goes by. And we need to think about that also when we think about the, the health and well-being of our communities and our regions. It's not just the political risks, it's not just the extreme conditions, it may also be these slower moving risks. And the, the final element is there is um, an impressive amount of knowledge and capability that's been built, over the last, built up over the last 30 years at CII. And there's incredible contributions both for CII and for the members to continue to contribute to the advancement of knowledge and practice. This is, um, I truly believe that, that the issue of sustainability and disaster resiliency is going to be, as Bud said earlier, the great cry to our industry for something, for help, as soon as possible, and it's going to call up the best that we have to offer. And we're going to need to do it faster and better and in completely different ways. And at lunch, I was talking with a, with, um, a gentleman from one of the utilities talking about recovering from an extreme event. And he said, well, what we need is a waterproof, place, a waterproof system for our high voltage units. And I said, you know, if you solve that problem, I think the Department of Defense and the General Services Administration and your local state offices, the state police department, would all appreciate knowing about that solution because we're all facing the same kind of problems. So I'd like to close with the, um, uh, the opportunity. What we're looking at is an opportunity to improve the quality of life under normal and extreme conditions. Being able to look at these benefits not just in terms of a wall that keeps out a huge wave of water that is then we have to look at day to day, but what are the things that we can do that improves life right now, immediately, and reduces our vulnerability? How do we develop and grow those regional resources? That's where our roots are. And finally, how do we invest in preemptive programs? We invest to more prudently use our resources and to be more resilient, and then we don't have to pay huge amounts of money to rebuild after the disasters. Thank you very much.